from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Um, my name is Un Yang, and I'm an anchor on NBC4 and host of an awesome show, thank you, uh, a show called Foodies DC, and I am happy to be back for my sixth or seventh year, I think, here at one of my favorite events of the year, the National Book Festival, where authors are treated like rock stars, and rightly so. And today, I am especially excited to be here because I get to introduce this man right here. Yay! And he coupled two of my favorite pastimes, reading and eating, with a wonderful cookbook right here called My Irish Table. You have to take a look for yourself. It's a beautiful, thoughtful, touching book, and it also has some recipes, too. <laughs> so take a look at that and pick one up. Um, if you don't know, Chef Cahal Armstrong here hails from Dublin. He is the owner of seven terrific restaurants. He's received so many awards. He's been on the list of so many best of everything that I can't even list them all. So I'm just going to go ahead and tell you that one of the best meals I've ever eaten in my life, and I eat a lot, was at one of his restaurants, Restaurant Eve, and it was amazing. And I think one of the reasons why the chef is as successful he, as he is is because he brings care and familiarity into his food. And he is not just a chef and an author, but he is a loving husband and a father. And I think you can sense that in the work that he does. I consider him a friend. I know his family. They're all awesome. But I think that is why his food tastes so good. It's the care he puts and the quality and the expertise he puts in every single thing that he presents and prepares. Um, and I don't know if you know, but Chef was way ahead of the curve when it came to this whole sustainable food movement. Restaurant Eve had a garden on the premises long before that became popular. He was making his restaurant green and environmentally friendly way before it became a thing. He really was on the forefront of all of that. And on top of that, he is a fervent fighter for nutrition in the school lunches. He is lobbying Congress. He is talking about how important it is to bring healthy lunches to the schools and for the children, because I don't know if you've seen some of the lunches. They're not great. So he's doing that as well. And something you might not know about Chef Armstrong, he is a black belt in Taekwondo. I mean, national championship black belt. The man can kick some butt. So if you don't eat your veggies, I'm kidding. He's not, he's not going to come down there. But I do want to tell you that he does take health and food very seriously. This man has lost 73 pounds, 73, in the course of a few years. And it wasn't a fat diet. It wasn't, I'm only going to eat broccoli for the rest of my life. It was a change in lifestyle. It was taking his health seriously. And he did it, and he looks amazing, and he's still cooking and eating wonderful food. One thing that has not changed over the course of his career, his intensity and his passion for cooking. So ladies and gentlemen, Chef Cahal Armstrong. She makes me sound like somebody I'd like to know. <laughs> um, so uh, good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Um, so before I begin this dish, we're, we're going to separate just a little politics uh, so that we don't get carried away with the wrong idea. This dish that I'm going to cook for you is one of, the, one of the dishes out of the cookbook, and it's nicknamed President Obama Stew. Okay, so that doesn't mean that I'm a Democrat or a Republican. Um, it, is, uh, it, it is a story, and I'll tell you the story, um, but I also cooked for President Bush. Uh, so we're kind of lucky in this area that we get to see some interesting people in the restaurant. And, and one night, um, <coughs> my brother showed up at, at uh, Dulles Airport and called me from Dublin to say, I'm here, come and get me. Surprise, you know, so I went out to the airport to pick Edward up. And he's the godfather of my, my son, Eamon. And so we went out there, picked him up, and I moved a whole bunch of things around and was able to change my schedule so that I didn't have to work on Saturday night. And so I decided that I would cook dinner at home rather than go out to a restaurant. And I started making this dish uh, uh, for, for the family for dinner. And you know, it's, it's, it, it, we got to that, just that certain point where the dish was just, just about to be perfect and almost ready to eat when the telephone rings. And so I look at the caller ID and I see that it's the restaurant calling. And I go, come on, I, one Saturday night in 11 years, 
that I'm off. Can you not leave me alone just once? And so I answer the phone all tempestuously and what? What do you want? And so it's the general manager at the other end of the line and he says, you need to come to work. And I go, why? Who could it possibly be? He says, the president is going to be here in half an hour. <laughs> okay, I'm on my way. <laughs> Edward, get in the phone. Get in the car. So, so we invented President Obama stew because of that. Okay, so this is a great, great dish to make in the fall. It's so easy. Um, it's uh, it's uh, a chicken casserole, okay? And my mother made all kinds of uh, these, you know, warm, hearty dishes when we were growing up, when we were kids. And, and this is one of my favorites, okay? And it is open to a little bit of interpretation as I'll talk about as we go through. So the first thing I want to show you is how to clean a chicken. <coughs> first, we want to make sure we have a sharp knife. We never work with dull knives. You cut yourself with dull knives, you never cut yourself with a sharp knife. You know, you, you find when your knives are not sharp that you have to put that pressure on to get it go through, but if the knife's sharp, it should just easily glide through the chicken and we can easily cut the pieces off. So we're just, you just ease into this joint. Can everybody see on the mirror here? Okay, so we just ease into this joint and the knife, the knife should just simply glide through it. I'm gonna take this little tip off the wing because it has no meat on it. Same thing, it just goes right into the joint. And we'll set that aside. And these pieces, anything I set aside here, we would use for chicken stock, okay? Um, cut the wings into little pieces. We'll take the thighs off. <coughs> okay, so once again, if you see how, it, how we do the thigh. We just pull on it so that gravity pulls, the weight of the chicken will pull it down. And that opens up this little gap here in the skin. And then if I just ease my knife in, we can get to where the joint is. And then I just twist to get the bone to come out of the joint. And then you can just glide your knife through and it comes off pretty easily, okay? We'll get this other part of the wing underneath here. And the same thing, I'm using the, the weight of the chicken to help me find where the joint is. <coughs> it was funny, we were at the restaurant a, uh, a couple of months ago and I was asking the wait staff about, about cooking and what they knew about cooking. And I asked 25 adults how many of them had ever roasted a chicken in their life. You know what the answer was? Two. Two out of 25 adults have ever roasted a chicken. They didn't know, wouldn't know, didn't know where to start. <coughs> okay, so the next part here, this is the backbone here. And the backbone will set aside for stock, so I'm just going to ease the, my knife through here. And then come straight down the backbone. Think about who annoyed me today while I take the backbone out. Okay. Again, in between the breast, there's a breast plate here, so we're just gonna ease our, our knife in here and then just a little tap. Not, it, do, it doesn't even take any effort. There's no weight, because the knife does everything. We'll just ease into that bone. And then we have our chicken cut up in pieces. Now, the, the, the reason I kind of slowed down there a little bit so that you could see is because once you have the chicken in this stage, there are so many dishes you can make with it. Uh, so many ways to do it. One of my personal favorite is this classic Spanish dish where you add about 40 cloves of garlic and about 30 bay leaves and you roast it and then deglaze the whole thing with lots and lots of vinegar. So delicious. Finger licking good. Okay, so we have our uh, chicken breast cut in pieces and then we're going to put a little salt on it. and we're going to sear the chicken. Okay, so this is an important part of the dish because a lot of our flavor is gonna come from here. Take this plastic thing off. Ugh. That's hot oil. You can tell it's hot, it's smoking. That's very hot oil. Now what do we do here? We're on fire, watch. Okay, that, that's a lesson for you to learn while, while we happen to be here, okay? We never move a pan that's on fire. I didn't want it to be on fire. The pan is too hot, which is the reason that it burst into flames. See? Okay, it's too hot. So we put it out by extinguishing it in its place. Never move it from where it is. Okay, so that's, that's a good lesson for us all to learn. <coughs> Salt will put the fire out, okay? And never panic. You see how I just didn't panic? I mean, I don't want a, the pan to be on fire. I don't want to burn the, uh, 
the place down, that would be really unfortunate. But I, I'm, I'm not going to panic, okay? And very often when you see something like that happen in a home, people panic, and then, then you're in trouble, okay? So we can just cool the pan down. Sorry, everybody. A good lesson learned. That's all right. That's all right because we got high size there. There's no oxygen getting in. What exciting fun. <laughs> I go tell my mom, hey, mom, guess what I did at work today? I burned down the convention center. OK, so back to where we were. We're going to add the pieces of chicken, and we're going to sear them in the pan. Highly skilled professionals. <laughs> Nobody moved. That was fun. Did you have fun? <laughs> All right, clean up our mess, graceful. <coughs> so while the chicken is searing, we're gonna start to add the next layers of flavor to our dish. And this dish, which, you know, all of the great dishes of the world um, are, uh, is, is about layering of complex flavors, one on top of the other. Uh, you know, paella and cassoulet and all these famous bouillabaisse, all these famous dishes in the world are all layers and layers of complex flavors. Okay, so what we're going to do is start to add new ingredients to it that are full of aromatics, okay? And in general, in cooking, when we refer to uh, aromatic food, we call it mirepoix, okay? So Mirepoix is a village that's just south of Bordeaux in France. And the chef of the Marquet de Mirepoix is the one who's attributed with having used aromatic vegetables in making sauce first, which is why it's called Mirepoix. So you want to be a little brave here when we're searing the chicken. Don't worry about it going on fire. And get a nice color, OK? This caramelization. This color is going to be a big part of the first layer of flavor in the dish. OK, nice brown pieces of chicken. And you know, let it, let it go. We want to push it to the edge of the cliff without falling off, falling off the edge. So I don't want it black, but I want it as dark, dark brown as I'm going to be brave enough to do, OK? That's going to be a huge part of the flavor of this dish. So while our chicken piece is brown in there, I'm going to cut up the aromatic vegetables. So we'll start with some onion. And I'm not going to be too careful about cutting it in small pieces, because we want the onion to be visible. We want to eat it. It's a really delicious flavor. So we'll just uh, we'll call that a medium-sized dice. Everybody see that one more time. So we go straight down first. And depending on how small you want the onion, so if I wanted it finer, I would make these, these straight down incisions closer to each other. And then I would go across here one time. And again, if I wanted it finer, I would make more cuts across the length of the onion. And then just again, straight down here, OK? So we're going to have some onion. We'll put that in for our stock later. We're going to add some celery. Is anybody watching the chicken? <laughs> it could go on fire. Not a chance. <clears throat> Not a chance. OK, and then we're going to use some celery. I love celery. For some reason, in, uh, in recent years, celery got a bad name. You consume more calories eating celery than you get from eating the celery. So your body actually uses more calories than there are in celery, which is 
kind of cool. It's like going backwards. It's like getting younger. <coughs> I don't know what that wine is there for. Maybe I'll drink it later. And then some carrots. And again, we'll just cut them in nice sized pieces that can stay in the stew and give it good flavor. Okay? I have some chopped garlic. I have some rosemary, some thyme, some basil, a little uh, spicy chili pepper. And the, the chili pepper part is optional. You can add more or less depending on how, uh, how spicy you like it. I like it to have just a little kick. I want, we, we like to eat this dish in the fall, the late fall and the, and the winter. Um, and just a little bit of spiciness, not to be spicy like curry, but just a little bit makes your body start to warm up and it's kind of exciting. <coughs> okay, so I'm just gonna move all the chicken pieces to one pan and we're gonna work in this, uh, in this casserole dish. And that, that really is the hard part of this dish. Everything that I've done so far, the work part is over. <coughs> so from here, so you'll see in the bottom of the pan there's some brown coloring, okay? In cooking we call that fond, okay? Which is the French word for the bottom. Profound, very deep. Which is why that pan didn't go on fire earlier. <coughs> and so we can start to add our uh, vegetables in here and what, the, what happens now is the water that's present in the vegetables will start to gradually bleed out of them and they will suck all that brown off the bottom of the pan and start to meld it into the dish and that, you know, add to the flavor and the deep, complex flavor that we're going to have in this dish when we're finished. Hopefully. We don't set it on fire again. <laughs> I'm going to use that one for weeks, I'm sorry. Wait till I tell you what I did today. So we'll just let them sweat in there for a little bit. And we can add the garlic. So once the vegetables start to become translucent, I'm going to add a little bit of flour to it, okay? Just a very small amount, a couple of tablespoons, because I don't want a thick stew, but I want some viscosity to it. Okay, so I want it to have mouthfeel, and that's a really important part in food that people forget about is texture and texture contrast. So many times over the years I've told pastry chefs, what's the most, the number one selling candy bar in the world? Anybody guess what it is? Snickers. <coughs> why? Why do you think Snickers is so much appeal and why it sells so well? Because it has texture contrast. It's not like that other one, what's it called, Baby Ruth, I think, has just one it has just one texture and that gets boring on the palate. So we want to make sure that we think about textures when we're cooking. So just a little bit of flour. If you're, the, the, there's this new wave of people being gluten intolerant, who knows why? Probably because the flour is really terrible quality. Um, you can use cornstarch, you know, but just use a little bit. Uh, potato starch is fine too. It's just a thickening agent. And so we'll add that and we want it to cook a little bit. We want to cook the gluten out of the flour to the extent that it's possible. The gluten molecule actually changes when you apply heat to it. <coughs> and then we're going to add some tomatoes. Give it a nice Mediterranean quality. Not too much because I don't want it to be uh, tomato sauce, but the tomato will uh, break up in there and add a nice flavor to it and give it a nice pretty color. <coughs> we always use your eyes first, you know, so you want it to look pretty as well as taste good, okay? And then as that, the flour, you see the, the, the flour is starting to thicken that, then I'm gonna add some chicken stock to it. And we'll just let that gently simmer away. Now, once we have all these pieces put together, now we can add the chicken in. And then the phone rings, and it's the President of the United States, what are you gonna do? What are you going to do? When the president was finished with dinner, I went out to the table to say hello to them, their anniversary, and just as I got to the table, Mrs. Obama tipped a glass of wine over on him. <laughs> so I discovered the leader of the free world covered in wine with a napkin in his hand wondering what to do next. Okay. I don't want any of this fat because that's not going to add 
any, anything of any quality to the dish, but this part certainly will. We want to make sure we get all of that. We can deglaze that pan. And I use two pans today to make it easier, to make it faster for me. I use both pans at once. But you can sear the chicken in batches ahead of time if you want to. We just make sure we deglaze and get all of that liquid out of there because that's good, good, good flavor. Okay. Give it a little bit more stock. We'll add our chili pepper, because that tastes good. <coughs> and then we'll start to add some herbs, OK? Uh, so I like to put basically thyme and rosemary are going to go into everything. And just chop this up a little bit so we don't get a big mouthful of rosemary. <coughs> so uh, we always recommend, I was talking about this a couple of minutes ago with rosemary that we blanch it in salty water and then mince it very, very, very finely so that you don't get that pine salt taste and you don't ever want to get a big mouthful of rosemary. But because it's going to stew in here and braise for a while, <coughs> we, can, we, we don't need to worry about that so much. If I'm using it in a more delicate way, um, I'm, I'm going to blanch and, and mince it every time, OK? Now we're making progress. The peppers are already cooked. These are roasted peppers that, that came in a jar. <coughs> so we don't need to put them in too early. They can go in as a garnish towards the end. Basil is a very delicate flavor. So when the dish is almost finished, I will just fold that in at the last second, OK? <coughs> Does anybody understand anything that I just said? <laughs> OK, not too much stock. You don't need to have too much. The vegetables are going to shrink. The chicken is going to shrink a little bit. You can add stock. You can't take it out. <coughs> and we'll get this baby 88 miles an hour. <coughs> we start to see a nice little gentle bubble. And that's basically where we're going to want to keep it with this little bubble. Can everybody see how it's just small little bubbles? <coughs> we don't want it boiling hard because that'll make the chicken very tough. We want it to gently simmer for about 45 minutes. A spoon, a spoon, my kingdom for a spoon. I got it in one, it's perfect. <laughs> I think it was the fire starter. <laughs> So uh, I'll, be, I'll be happy at this point to answer any questions about this recipe. I'll answer any questions about the book and how I wrote the book and why I, why I wrote the book that took two years to write and why I'm crazy enough to think about writing another book. Yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah. Um, so I salted the chicken at the beginning. Uh, before I seasoned it, uh, and it's kind of important to season the chicken at the beginning so that so that there's because there's an interaction between uh, the the proteins in the chicken and the salt that make a good crust and and make it beautiful and brown. And then when I just tasted the stew to see where it is for salt, the salt that I used to season the chicken actually turns out to be enough at this stage. So it doesn't need any more salt added to it. But you could if you wanted to. You know that's just that salt is kind of a taste thing. Um, and remember, <coughs> the, the big thing with salt, you can add more, you can't take it away. Once it's in, it's in. Yes, ma'am. Why did <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> Why didn't you wash your hands after you handled the raw chicken? <coughs> well, a number of reasons. Number one, there's nowhere to wash hands up here. <laughs> um, number two, uh, no one is actually going to eat this, unfortunately. Um, Realistically, it's perfectly safe because the, the chicken is going to be cooked for 45 minutes. It's going to be well done. Any bacteria that may have been present anywhere, any cross-contamination con is already in the same dish. We're only making one dish. So we've kind of compensated for the fact that we don't have anywhere to wash hands up here. It's perfectly safe. Um, but 
you're absolutely right. You wanna you wanna wash your hands every time. One of the one of the, the I think you know the health department nowadays requires us to wear these gloves for food that's ready to eat. Okay, so the the which is you know kind of a good idea, except that you know young chefs get this notion that once they put the glove on, they're safe. So you can pick your nose, you can scratch yourself, and you're still safe because you have a glove on. And it, it's really better to just teach people to wash your hands every time you pass by a hand sink. Wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Um, <clears throat> if we washed our hands every time we saw a sink, we would never be sick. The number one source for bacteria in the world is human hands. Is it possible to overcook this dish, or basically after 45 minutes you're good? Sir? Is it possible to overcook this dish, or is it 45 minutes or more and you're okay? Um, so if you go longer than about 45 minutes simmering like this, you will find that the breast meat will be a little dry and a little tough. Um, the leg meat and the thigh meat can handle cooking more and more, and it's perfectly okay. Um, but, but ideally, and I talk a lot about this in the book because, because the book is Irish driven and food that I ate at home, we make a lot of stews. There's shepherd's pie, there's a good, great recipe for beef stew. There's this recipe. Ideally, what you want to do is cook it, let it cool all the way down in the liquid, and then gently reheat it, okay? What happens when we apply heat to meat is it retracts. And as it does that, it shrinks, it forces all of its own juices out into the surrounding liquid. And that's why you find, if you eat your stew right away, that it's kind of dry. As it cools down, it relaxes again, it absorbs all that flavor back inside again, and you get a much better quality stew. So it's kind of important, particularly with braised meat, that you let it cool all the way down and then, uh, and then reheat it the next day uh, in, a, in a gentle way. Chicken is a bit more forgiving than that. So this, this, is a, this is a good dish to, you know, everybody sees how long that took for me to put together, basically from scratch. All I did was peel the onions and chop the herbs earlier. So basically from scratch, I have dinner ready in an hour. And because chicken is so forgiving, it's an easy meal when we get home from work to put together quite quickly, okay? Hi, uh, I've got more of a general question about Irish food, which yeah. is, uh, I was just over visiting friends in Ireland um, this summer, and one of the foods we really loved was brown soda bread. Right. And I've been trying to recreate that here, but what I find is both the flour isn't coarse enough, and I think the buttermilk is not quite right here. Yeah. So I was wondering if you had any suggestions on how to, how to make that in the States. Okay, so <clears throat> the, the flour that we use to make brown bread in Ireland is called whole meal flour. Mm -hmm. It's not whole grain flour, which is very different. Okay, so whole meal is rolled and has bigger uh, pieces to it, and it's important when you're making your brown bread to use that flour and not whole grain flour. You will not get the same result. What you get when you use whole grain flour is a very dry bread. That's, that's number one. Number two, the, the buttermilk is okay here, but the ideal thing and what, what people in Ireland always used for, for the milk part of the bread was sour milk. So we would just take whole milk and leave it out overnight and let it turn sour. And that adds that slightly sour flavor to, to your bread. Um, there is a website called food, foodireland.com. They sell the whole meal flour. Um, and there are some specialty places that you, that you can, uh, that where you can go into. Um, but that's, that's the key thing is the flour. Okay. okay? And it is a, there's a good recipe for it in the book. It's a great, it's a great, great bread. In, in fact, uh, for, for Christmas Day, we always had brown bread and smoked salmon with a little lemon juice on it for, for our appetizer. So delicious. Um, this, this dish is going to be really easy to pair, uh, to pair with wine-wise because it's so complex. It can go with a lot of different wines. It's kind of Spanish-influenced, kind of. Um, so I would tend to lean towards that area, maybe the Basque region or the southern Rhone or north of Spain. Something like Verdejo or Albariño would be really delicious with it. I have um, a two-part question. Part one is, your white pot, what is it made from? And is there a preference when you bring all the ingredients together to make a stock? Um, yeah, this is uh, Le Creuset, is the, is the name of the brand. It's cast iron, um, and it's a great, great brazing pot to buy. These will last a lifetime. Okay. 
Um, so th uh, they come with lids, and at this stage in the meal, we put a lid on it. Um, just slightly open so some of the water can evaporate that's in the dish and the, the stock is then gently reducing and becoming more concentrated. So the all-round Staub is another brand, S-T-A-U-B, or Le Creuset are, are, the, are a good way to go. And great gifts. Okay, thank you so much. My pleasure. You had a question? <laughs> um, <coughs> I'm Irish, we like to drink wine. <laughs> We don't like to waste it by putting it in our food. <laughs> <laughs> Having said that, there are times when wine is appropriate in food and you want that distinctive flavor of wine. Um, and I, I will always think about that aspect of it. Do I want to taste white wine in the dish or do I want to taste red wine in the dish? And really what I'm focusing on, and very much we do this at Restaurant E, we're focusing on the best possible ingredients that we can find anywhere in the world, we really want to show off the ingredients and not hide it with that slightly sharp taste of white wine. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Can anybody, can you, I can't hear you, sorry. Oh, thank you, yeah, we, we love Old Town. It's a great, it's a great town. And, yeah, we, we'll, I mean, I was looking for somewhere that was kind of quaint and had that nice mood to it. And uh, very often we forget in Washington, D.C. that Old Town is only 10 minutes away and the best restaurant in the world is there for dinner. <laughs> Shame, shameful marketing. So, Hal, my, my understanding is that you change the menu there every day. How far in advance do you plan those? Um, so... The, the menus at Restaurant Eve are defined by what's on the, at the markets. There are four main uh, groups of farmers that we buy produce from. Tuscarora Organic Co-op, Path Valley Farms, which is a co-op of Amish and Mennonite farmers in Pennsylvania. Um, Davencrest Farm, which is in Easton, and then Leedstown Farm, which is in Colonial Beach. So they supply us with most of our fruits and vegetables. And those are relationships that I've had for a long time. They depend on phone calls. You know, Bob, who runs Leestown Farm, calls me at home at 1 o'clock in the morning on Monday and says, I have corn, I have asparagus, I have this, and he'll, so he'll deliver that on Wednesday. So then that's the starting point. <clears throat> then we look at what meat and fish is available from local sources in, the in a similar way. And then we have a menu meeting at nighttime when we're finished with service. And we'll say, okay, so we have some scallops. We have some truffles, we have some asparagus, we have some of this, we have some of that. What are we gonna do with it? How are we gonna create a new dish? And together as a creative team with me guiding everybody, the team of 15 chefs that we have will decide what a new dish is gonna be. So there are days when we'll change four or five dishes on the menu. There, are days, there may be days when we change one ingredient on one dish. Um, and it's all just driven by what the most beautiful things I can find are. So, um, for searing, we use canola oil, okay? Canola oil is a very advantageous oil to us because it has a high smoke point, which means it doesn't go on fire <laughs> until you get it to a very high point, okay? So it has a high smoke point. Olive oil has a lower smoke point. It would go on fire much faster than the oil did earlier, okay? Um, it also has no flavor. So if I'm searing a piece of fish or the best duck breast that you can find or beautiful chicken from Polyface Farm in, in Stanton, I want you to taste the chicken, not the oil, okay? So for general cooking purposes, we use canola oil. We'll add olive oil for finishing if I want that distinctive flavor of olive oil in a dish. Hi, Chef. Do you have uh, any new restaurants or concepts in the works? No. <laughs> And, uh, That's not necessarily true, but no is the answer to the question. <laughs> um, a little philosophical question. You know, you recently renovated Restaurant Eve a little. There's a trend towards more casual eateries. In fact, a lot of fine dining seems to be going out of style. Do yeah. you think that'll continue, or do you think fine dining, just like all other food trends, will come back? Um, I, really, I really hope that it is not a long-term trend. Fine dining is special occasion eating. It's not something we do every day. Um, if I ate the food that we serve at Restaurant Eve every day, I would be four or 500 pounds, okay? But it is designed for a special occasion. 
and white tablecloth and silver and crystal should be reserved for special occasions. Just like at Christmas, you bring out your finest china and you cook this beautiful extravagant meal or a Thanksgiving or whatever uh, special occasion you have. <clears throat> Those special restaurants need to always be there and, and we as a culture need to support them to make sure that a, a, a history of hundreds of years of developing fine dining stays. Casual dining is something that we see in America probably more than any, other, any other country in the world because so many of us are working and going out to eat is easier and often more less expensive than it is to cook at home. So casual dining restaurants are great and they, and they have their place. But I, don't, I really don't believe that we as a culture want to go in the direction of eliminating the fine dining restaurant. Use it for what, it, for what it's meant for, for the special occasion. They, yes, they're expensive and we've had this discussion so many times about the difference between expensive and overpriced. Okay, Coca-Cola is overpriced. $1.75 for a can of sugar water is overpriced. Restaurant Eve is expensive because all of the ingredients we use are the finest ingredients we can find. It takes a lot of people to produce it and everything we touch is expensive, so it's an expensive restaurant. It's not overpriced, two different things. Reserve those things, use them for special occasions, for your birthday, your anniversary, and everybody should have five birthdays a week. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, so I, I meet with the chefs of the other restaurants regularly. Uh, I design the menus for them. I tell them what the dishes are. I tell them what the expectations are. I visit them occasionally, and we supervise their finances, which is kind of important. Have to pay the rent. Yes, sir. Yes, on a trip to Ireland, I tried to embrace the culture and actually tried blood pudding. Mm. What is with that? Delicious. Yeah. Delicious. There's a recipe for black pudding in the book. And it's disgusting. Yeah. To make it is, I love eating it, but making it is nasty. <coughs> um, so black pudding is a, is a blood sausage. And uh, you can go to some Asian stores around here. Uh, the Korean supermarkets sell blood. Uh, and it's this jellified pig's blood, nasty thing that you mix with some weed and some fat. And we see, put some seasonings in it. And then we pipe it into a casing and you poach it. And the blood coagulates in the poaching process. And it's really delicious. It's definitely an acquired taste. If you wash it down with six or seven pints of Guinness, it doesn't hurt so bad. <laughs> um, just in, in a, a parting note, I, I wrote this book. It's a very personal book. It has a lot of uh, stories about what I ate growing up, how I became a chef, how I ended up in America. I came here as an illegal immigrant in 1990. I got my green card in the lottery, uh, became an American citizen about six years ago. Um, <clears throat> so there are recipes that are very traditionally Irish. There are some recipes that are just things that my mother cooked and cooks better than anybody else. Things that my father cooked and cooks better than anybody else. My father cooks the best paella I've ever had. And I've had it in Spain where they invented it. So they're personal stories. Um, we often think of Ireland as being a place where the food is terrible because the, you know, the, the, the old fashioned Irish cooking technique is boiled the bejesus out of it. <laughs> um, but in fact, they're very complex dishes with lots of braising techniques and layers of complex flavors. Ireland is rich agriculturally. It's ideally located where the Gulf of Mexico keeps the climate moderate and temperate. We have green grass year round. We have the best beef, the best uh, dairy product. We are the number two producer of beef for McDonald's worldwide, and we only have a tiny, tiny island. Um, it's not allowed in America, which is why McDonald's in America sucks so bad. Don't say that out loud. <laughs> Somebody might hear us. <coughs> um, and it, it's an island, so it has great seafood. It's a great place to visit. Uh, but America's home for me now. Nice. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.